position, uh, when, once you recognize that even if I cause a conflict, if I hit him on the head, then he must come to me and I decide what is right and what is wrong and then typically decide, of course, that what I did was likely right and what he did uh, that is complaining about the fact that I hit him on the head was a wrong and then I tell him in addition that this is the amount of money that you have to pay me for providing you with this magnificent service. Um, so it should be from the outset very clear that to explain why there have been attempts to form an institution such as states is anything but difficult. This is easy as pie to explain why there are constant attempts, so to speak, to try to form institutions such as this. Because what more wonderful position could one have, so to speak, uh, as somebody who has uh, parasitic inclinations than being in charge of an apparatus such as a state. Um, so to explain why attempts to found states is a very, very easy thing to do. What is a difficult thing to do uh, is um, to explain uh, why anybody can get away with this. Um, why people do not prevent such institutions from, um, from coming into existence. Um, and I will turn now to this task to explain why people would ever put up with an institution such as this. Um, this explanation becomes even more difficult, so to speak, once you recognize the following. Um, which, uh, which I call the fundamental law of parasitism. The fundamental law of parasitism is simply this. Uh, one parasite can live off uh, hundred or thousand hosts uh, very comfortably. Um, but we cannot imagine that uh, thousands of parasites can live a comfortable life uh, of one or two or three hosts. In that case, uh, their life would be miserable too. So what we recognize from this fundamental law of parasitism is that those people who aspire to institute an institution such as a state must also always have an interest to be themselves just a small group uh, that is capable of, yeah, of ruling, of exploiting, of taxing and exercising uh, uh, an arbitration monopoly over a group of people far larger than they themselves are. Um, and if this is the case, that the state must always attempt to be a very small group as compared to the group which they exploit, uh, then we realize or recognize some other uh, fundamental insight. Um, obviously, a small group, a very small group, uh, cannot subject a large group only by means of brutal force and weapons. Yes, for a short time that might be possible. We can imagine that there are 10 people who are all heavily armed that might control 200, 300, 400 people and keep them in subjection if they have no arms and the rulers do have arms. Um, but in the long run, this is very difficult to maintain. That is, we must expect that these 400, 500 people will also find a way to arm themselves. And in that case, how can 10 people equipped with arms rule over 400, 500, or thousands of people 
also equipped with arms and means to defend themselves. Uh, then the explanation of violence does it, sheer brute for force does it, this explanation does not work. What we recognize instead is uh, the class of the parasites, the small group of parasites must, if it wants to rule uh, over lengthy periods of time over a population, must base its power on, uh, on opinion. Uh, that is, it must have uh, at least tacit support among the public. The public must have taken on uh, a position where they put up with this, uh, somehow see a reason in having this institution and so forth. Um, the public must have accepted certain ideologies. Um, and the insight which has been first uh, formulated by Etienne de la T and then by David Hume, and we also find that uh, by in, in Ludwig von Mises and in uh, Murray Rothbard, uh, the basic insight is uh, the rule of the state uh, over its population uh, depends <coughs> not on the exercise of uh, sheer brute force, even though that plays some role, but is fundamentally, rests fundamentally on nothing else but opinion and tacit agreement on the part um, of, uh, of the public. Um, so then the task becomes um, to explain the transition uh, from a natural order as I described it yesterday from a system of feudalism where essentially no state organizations uh, existed to a state of affairs where a stable uh, state institution has come into existence. Um, and let's assume for a moment uh, so to speak, the most favorable situation for state formation uh, without ha having uh, a state already there. What I mean by this is the following scenario. Um, let's assume we have a feudal king who is, so to speak, the natural monopolist of conflict resolution. By natural monopolist, I mean uh, every person, whenever they have conflicts with each other, do in fact go to the king and say, come on, you are the most prestigious, most wise, and uh, most experienced person. Uh, I'll ask you to settle the dispute that I have with uh, somebody else. People are entirely free to choose different arbitrators, different judges, so to speak. But as a matter of fact, um, they all go to uh, go to the king um, to to do this. Uh, such a scenario would still be what I call a natural order. Um, the king in this situation would receive nothing but rental payments from his own tenants um, uh, and um, uh, the nobles would receive uh, rental payments uh, from their tenants. There is no exploitation of any kind uh, going on. The king does not tax anyone, anyone who has property that is independent of the property of the king. Uh, the king also does not pass any laws, that is, he does not legislate. Of course, he lays down the rules that his tenants have to.